they came in wave after wave, destroying, burning, looting, raping, devastating all I had known and all I had loved. Our military forces fought hard for over two years against the invading army, but they could not withstand the might and power of an overwhelming force. And now my life is completely turned upside down. I expect to be killed like so many others have been, but I will face death with the strength Yahweh my God gives me. However, a fate often worse than death, slavery, seems to be my lot as I am shackled and chained with many other young men my age. We are all from royal or noble families, wealthy sons of privilege, now stripped of any societal status and marching away as spoils of war to be sold to the highest bidder as... Uh, I imagine is going to happen. Again, I will face my future with the power and strength my God gives me. To my surprise, we aren't taken to the auction block, rather we're taken to the king's court and told, the king's court of this conquering army, and we're told that for three years we're going to be educated and then we're going to serve in the king's personal court. Yes, we will still be slaves in a foreign country, but not serving in the fields or mines to be used up and discarded as beasts. Instead, we'll be fed well and we'll have many freedoms. It isn't too long, however, before my first test comes, my first temptation to not honor God, to just go with the flow. And it seems like such a small thing I am being tested with. But neglecting God in the small things often leads to neglecting God altogether. What was my test, my temptation? Well, we are offered the finest food and the, to eat and the finest wine to drink. Well, what's the problem with that, you say? Well, the problem is this food and this wine is very specific in that it has been offered as a sacrifice to false gods. And if I were to eat and drink it, I would be compromising my faith in Yahweh, the God of gods. So at its core, eating this food and drinking this wine is really about swaying us to worship other gods. Only I and three others refuse to eat and drink this fine food and wine. And we do so with great risk. We could have been killed on the spot, but we still refuse to eat and drink food offered to false gods. Now, I haven't told you this yet, but I am 17 years old. But I determined at a much younger age, I would not be bullied or swayed to abandon my faith. And I am willing to die rather than deny my God because I know I will be raised to eternal life. I will lose my position. I will lose my wealth and possessions and my very life, but I will never lose my faith. When I say I am willing to lose my position and my very life, I meant it at 17 years of age. And I mean it now. Over the years, I've risen to the highest positions of government. And throughout it all, serving in a foreign, ungodly government, I never compromised, not once. There were many times I could have, but I always stand my ground even if it means I could be put to death. I'm 80 years old now. And even though I am the king's favorite advisor, I am facing death because of my faith. And just like when I was 17, I determined that I will face it with the power Yahweh my God gives me. Over the years, I learned there's always jealousy among the king's court. And I have been the target many times of evil and unscrupulous men jockeying for position. But this one is the worst I've ever faced and the best tactic to destroy me my enemies have ever used. They put me in this position of facing execution 
by using my unwavering commitment to Yahweh against me. So here's what I do. I double down. And I throw open the windows of my house and kneel and pray to Yahweh my God in the sight of anyone looking. See, a law has been recently passed that only the king is to be prayed for for 30 days. But laws such as this, I will not obey. Laws like this are meant to be broken. And I am willing to pay the price. The king, to his credit, is in distress because he's been caught in a trap that he did not devise but fell into because of his pride. And now he can't get out of it. Even though he is the king and even though he's tried to save my life, the king's law has to be obeyed, and he signed my death certificate when he signed that law into effect. My name is Daniel, and this is part of my story. Daniel chapter 6, verses 16 through 23. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you continually, uh, sir, sir, excuse me, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he reached the den, he cried out in anguish to Daniel. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke, my God sent his angel, and shut the lion's mouths. They haven't hurt me, for I was found innocent before him. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den uninjured, for he trusted in his God. As I said last week, we all have qualities, good, bad, and neutral, that we pick up knowingly or unknowingly from others. The style in which you speak and walk and move, your mannerisms and the deeper things about you, such as your values and your faith, if you're a believer in Jesus or not a believer in Jesus, we're caught, so to speak, from others having influence over your life. The key for a godly life, for a believer in Jesus, is to minimize or get rid of completely the not-so-positive things we've picked up and maximize those that are most like Jesus so that we have a Jesus influence on those around us, so others can imitate us. A goal every believer in Jesus should strive for is to live in such a way that others can imitate us. That was the goal of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 11.1, imitate me then just as I imitate Christ. Who is Paul and why can he make such a bold statement? Well, Paul has a huge impact on the early church. And he still has a huge impact on the church to this very day because Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books we find in the New Testament portion of our Bibles. The New Testament was all written after Jesus' birth and completed by AD 70 before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Paul, is chosen by Jesus himself to be his ambassador to the known world, to the nations at the time, to share the gospel of Jesus, to share the story of Jesus. And during this series, we're looking at and discovering how to develop character qualities in our lives that Paul has that he's picked up from Jesus. You know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And last week, the quality we looked at was surrender. And if you missed that message, you can catch it online at hollychurch.org slash messages. Today's character quality is one all great men and women of faith have, but I chose to begin this message with sharing part of Daniel's story because he has this character quality in spades. What is it? Grit. He had it for his entire life, from boyhood to adulthood to old age. He never once compromises his faith, no matter what comes his way, even risking death. Now, the Bible is very honest about those who follow God. And if they have faults, the Bible shares those. But the Bible has nothing bad to say about Daniel. And even his enemies can't find any fault in him. 
Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. The Apostle Paul has this character quality of grit in spades as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been whipped much more, and I have been near death more often. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I have been in shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. In my travels, I have been in danger from floods and from robbers, in danger from my own people and from the nations. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilds, dangers on the high seas, and dangers from false friends. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without food, shelter, or clothing, and not to mention other things. Every day... I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Daniel has grit. Paul has grit. Every believer in Jesus needs this character quality of grit. Now, grit is defined in various ways, but here's my definition for grit based on what the Bible teaches. Grit, the inner determination to be faithful to God. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate God. Christ. And Jesus, through his grit and determination, is the one who establishes a new covenant, a new agreement where we can be made right with our Creator through our belief and our obedience to Jesus. Jesus, knowing we and all of creation are twisted and damaged by sin to the point that we cannot enter into the presence of a holy, perfect God, he is willing, Jesus is willing to be a sinless that is a perfect sacrifice in our place so that we can be made holy through Jesus' holiness, through Jesus' perfection. Sin is a horrible thing that hurts people and separates us from our God who loves people. So what's a perfect God who loves us going to do to solve this problem of sin? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Christ is never sinned, but God treated him as a sinner so Christ could make us acceptable to God. And I want you to think about the grit Jesus has to accomplish this, you know, being treated as a sinner to make us acceptable to God. More grit than any other person who's ever lived has had. Jesus' road to die on the cross of suffering begins, his suffering begins when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion. In the dark stillness of this garden, Jesus isn't just praying, he's crying, he's weeping, he's sweating, and he's not just sweating sweat, he's sweating great drops of blood. So his blood begins to be shed for us in the garden. Now, after he is arrested, Jesus endures six trials, three before the Jewish authorities and three before the Roman authorities. He's taken first. His first Jewish trial is he's taken to Annas, who is a former high priest and the father-in-law to the current high priest, Caiaphas. He's really the one pulling the string still. That's where his first trial is. His second trial, then, is before Caiaphas, the current high priest, and during this trial, he, during these trials, Jesus is mocked, he's spit on, he's hit, he's slapped, he's punched. And during the third trial, they change the charge against Jesus from blasphemy to revolt, to manipulate Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, to sentence Jesus to crucifixion. Blasphemy isn't a death penalty crime under Roman law, but revolution, revolt is. 
And with this new charge against Jesus, the Jews take him to Pilate, his first Roman trial, who tries to release Jesus because he immediately sees that they're only bringing Jesus before him because they're jealous of Jesus. Now, Pilate doesn't want to crucify Jesus, and he thinks he's found an out because he discovers that Jesus is actually from Galilee, and that jurisdiction is ruled over by Herod who happens to be in Jerusalem at this time to celebrate the Passover. Herod rules under the authority of Rome, but he's also a Jew, and that's why he's in Jerusalem for the Passover. Herod mocks Jesus and then sends him back to Pilate. Pilate, his third Roman trial here, Pilate at this point, after bargaining back and forth, ultimately washes, gets a bowl, washes his hands, and tells the Jews, I wash my hands of the blood of this innocent man. His blood is on your hands. And at this point, Jesus is sentenced to be crucified. Pilate sentences him, sentences him to that fate. Now, Jesus has already sweated blood. He's been beaten and mocked. He's gone without food and water. And now the Roman soldiers strip him naked and beat him with a whip of leather with metal balls woven into the le leather. And at the end of each leather strand are pieces of broken glass, pottery, nails, bone, twisted metal, all designed to just tear your flesh from your body. And these beatings are nicknamed the half death because half of the people who receive them die before ever going to the cross. But not Jesus. He has more to endure because this, what Jesus goes through, this is how much God hates sin. You don't have to question if God hates sin. Look at what Jesus goes through. And at the same time, though, what Jesus goes through is how much God loves you. You can look to Jesus and not doubt how much God loves you. The soldiers place a crown of thorns on his head and then smack him around the head and face with a wooden rod, driving the thorns into Jesus' skull. The blood flows down his face. His face would be a crimson mask by this time. Then they place the cross upon his back and lead him out of the city to Golgotha, a hill that's outside the city of Jerusalem, where Jesus is stripped again and nailed to a cross. There he hangs naked and bleeding while being mocked until at the six hour mark of hanging on a cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cries out these words because at that exact moment, Jesus is enduring all the wrath of God for sin. It's all falling on Jesus, the sin of all creation. And then Jesus yells out, it is finished. He bows his head and dies. The consequence for sin has been paid in full by the blood of Jesus, by the perfect, sinless lamb of God, who, because of his grit, his endurance, now reigns from his heavenly throne. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, a whole bunch of people of faith with grit who have passed away before us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance, with grit, the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of God's throne. We have a great legacy of grit to aspire to. And here's some ways to develop this character quality in your own life. Think back to Daniel. He's part of a royal or noble family. He has the best of everything, but then it all falls apart. He has nothing. He has less than nothing, and most people would fall apart, but Daniel does not fall apart because he has built his life on Yahweh, the one true God, from boyhood. 
Now, you and I have never faced all Daniel faced. You and I have never faced all Paul faced or what Jesus faced. But we all face our own struggles, our own disappointments, our own battles. We all have our own storms, big ones, small ones, and medium-sized ones that come into our life. So we have to develop grit, the inner determination to be faithful to God. Here's how you do it. I develop grit by realizing I will encounter setbacks in life. Don't expect life to always be easy. Some people are under this impression that it should always be easy. Don't expect that. If your expect expectation is for your life to always be easy, you're not going to develop grit. You're just going to curl up in a ball in a corner or you're going to self-medicate with harmful substances or you're going to become bitter and angry instead of developing grit. I develop grit by remaining in control of my emotions. Now, this does not mean you don't show your emotions or that you don't have emotions. God created us with emotions, but God never intended for our emotions to rule over our hearts and mind. Only God is worthy to do that. Only God is worthy enough to rule over our hearts and over our minds. So how do you direct your emotions to keep you from feeling, you know, your faith has failed you when you're going through a setback in life? Well, let me remind you of this. It's from a few weeks ago. I was sharing a message on uh, how to have peace in your panic. It's the third message in our miracle series. If you missed it, you can watch it online at hollychurch.org slash messages. You know, how do you direct your emotions to keep you from feeling, feeling like your faith has failed you when you're going through a setback in life? You remember, God is with you always, and he's working out his purposes in your life. I develop grit by resisting the temptation to quit. At times, your faith is going to be tested. It's going to be shaken. And you can begin to question God's care and God's love. I'm fairly certain both Daniel and Paul thought about quitting and just going along with the status quo. But they didn't. And I'm going to tell you, don't quit. Don't give up your faith. At age 17, Daniel, while being marched away as a prisoner of war, didn't quit believing in God, didn't quit trusting God, didn't quit obeying God. At age 80, Daniel, when facing certain death, didn't quit believing in God, trusting in God, obeying God. Paul, when going through everything we read about earlier in his life, all that trouble, didn't quit believing in God, didn't quit trusting God, didn't quit obeying God. Jesus, when enduring the agony of the cross and everything leading up to it, didn't quit believing in God the Father, didn't quit trusting in God the Father, didn't quit obeying God the Father. Why? They were unwilling to trade the temporary comforts of this lifetime for a, an eternity of blessings beyond our imaginations in heaven. And each one of them had grit, a inner determination to be faithful to God no matter what. So I developed grit. grit by realizing I will encounter setbacks in life, by remaining in control of my emotions, by resisting the temptation to quit, and by relying on God to bring me through. Because no matter how grit, much grit you have, you know, how, no matter how tough you are, at some point, grit runs out. And you have to rely on God's power, like Daniel. Daniel 6.22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not harmed me. Like Paul, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9, my friends, I want you to know what a hard time we had in Asia. Our sufferings were so horrible and so unbearable that death seemed certain. In fact, we felt sure we were going to die. But this made us stop trusting in ourselves and start trusting God who raises the dead to life. Like Jesus, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having grit doesn't mean you do not rely on God 
Ultimately, to have grit, you must rely on God to see you through. I develop grit by realizing I will face setbacks, by remaining in control of my emotions, by resisting the temptation to quit, and by relying on God's power. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. We never give up. We have grit. Our bodies are gradually dying, but we ourselves are being made stronger each day. That is, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you have believed and been baptized into Jesus. These little troubles are getting us ready for an eternal glory that will make all our troubles seem like nothing. Things that are seen don't last forever, but things that are not seen are eternal. This is why we keep our minds on the things that cannot be seen. Let's pray. Lord, empower us by your spirit and your wisdom. Strengthen us to remain faithful no matter what. Develop this holy character quality of grit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.